I'm Jeff Mills. And I'm Charlene Lurig. And this is Our Desired Future. A story of how we can keep water flowing in Texas, a state whose population is expected to add another 15 million people over the next 30 years. Across Texas, people are looking underground for the next source of water. While some are saying that this hidden resource is the answer to our water shortages, others claim there's not enough to go around. So why are Texans fighting over this seemingly limitless hidden resource? On today's program, we'll go underground with divers to explore what groundwater is. We'll meet with a farmer whose family's been fighting for their right to pump groundwater for 60 years, and some families in Central Texas who are living entirely from the water caught from their roofs. The first thing to understand about Texas is that we're actually sitting on massive underground stores of water. Beneath the neighborhoods and ranch lands of Texas lie thousands of feet of geologic history. Rocks and sand built up over billions of years of continental shifts, volcanic eruptions, ancient floods, and the retreat of long forgotten seas. And it's within this underground world that most of Texas water is hidden, some 500 times more than anything you see on the surface. In our era of epic drought and booming population, Texans are pumping more of this groundwater than ever before. The question is, how much of it should we pump? and how fast? The answer to this question will affect the 40 million Texans who will one day call this place home. That's because in Texas, we're taking more water out of the ground than nature is putting back in. The more we pump, the lower the groundwater level falls, affecting everything from wells to rivers. To understand how, we met with some very brave men. Hi, I'm Greg Tatum. I'm the director of the Jacobs Well Exploration Project. Hi, my name is David Moore. I'm the assistant director of the Jacobs Well Exploration Project. It was about 95 degrees the day we met up with the members of the Jacobs Well Exploration Project in Wimberley, Texas. But they were suiting up in thermal underwear, wool socks, and dry suits. Tatum and Moore were about to spend the next four and a half hours swimming through the water that lies beneath this part of Central Texas. Greg Tatum. Today's dive, we're going back approximately 3,500 to 4,000 feet in the cave total duration of the dive will be just under four and a half hours. Jacob's Well is not open for recreational diving, and for good reason. At what appears to be the bottom, the cave entrance opens up into a larger room, about 55 feet deep. From there, Tatum explains, he and Moore will have to squeeze themselves and their equipment through a sloped passageway barely more than a foot across. The problem that we encounter is this slope is made of gravel. The gravel is right at the angle of repose, and it tends to want to cascade downward with any small disturbance. So our technique is to literally swim through the gravel. We have seen instances where the gravel will completely fill back in behind us. So eh, it's a little unsettling, but you you learn to cope with it. We get some odd looks from people when we're diving here and they can't understand what would cause us to risk our life and spend so much money on equipment. And when you tell, they say, what's in that cave? And when you tell them wet rocks, they just kind of arch an eyebrow and laugh. And, but that's r- literally what's in there. It's dark and it's full of rocks. Moore and Tatum are one of the handful of people who can say they have swum through an aquifer. In the case of Jacob's Well, the Trinity Aquifer, one of Texas' nine major underground stores of water. In the area around Jacob's Well, the Trinity is made up of highly porous rock. This means that here, the aquifer can recharge quickly after a rain. It can also easily drop in response to increased pumping, says Tatum. Jacob's actually stopped flowing in 2010 due to the drought. It's directly linked to rainfall, the number of groundwater wells in the area, and you can actually see when they energize their their wells, it affects the discharge rate at Jacob's. As Wimberley's population has grown, so have the number of groundwater wells. And as that pumping has increased, the flow at Jacob's well has slowed. But that, says Tatum, 
hasn't stemmed the pressure to drill more wells. The development, one being a golf course, which was directly over the aquifer. Lower flows from Jacob's Well can have repercussions miles away. And because of the strange nature of water in Texas, these repercussions may be felt in very different places. Some of the water in Jacob's Well will flow down the Blanco River, eventually winding up in the Gulf of Mexico. But researchers were surprised to find a few years ago that some of the water downstream of Jacob's Well may disappear underground again, this time into a different aquifer, the Edwards, only to reappear above ground once again 30 miles northeast in Austin Spartan Springs or 30 miles southeast in San Marcos. Hold on, I'm trying to follow this. So you're saying that the water that these divers swim through in Jacob's Well can end up months later in totally different places that are separated by, what, 100 miles? That's right. And that it could go north or it could go south and it could be above ground or it could be below? Yep. All this is complicated. But the point is, in central Texas, water below ground doesn't stay below ground. And water above ground frequently disappears below the surface. So surface water can become groundwater, which can become surface water again. And in some places, this can happen in the span of as little as a few days. But here's the thing. Despite this artificial distinction between the water above ground and the water below in the state of Texas, the two are treated as legally distinct systems. This legal distinction sets up the potential for serious conflict between people who rely on the same water. To understand why, we sent reporter Sarah Wilson to visit a place called Comanche Springs. June 12, 1936. Welcome, Water Carnival visitors. The show begins this morning at 10.30 a.m. with a band concert by the Fort Stockton High School Band at Comanche Springs. Fort Stockton, Texas is in the heart of oil country, about an hour from Midland, Odessa. It's a place of dusty bluffs and dry washes, but what makes Fort Stockton different is water. Water Carnival is the annual festival in Fort Stockton's Comanche Springs Pool, an event known for more than seven decades for its synchronized swimming. In July, I met up with the organizers of the 2014 Water Carnival. I'm Vivian Tillotson Hickman. Darla Snailam Poulos. Jackie King Cosper. How many towns in West Texas specialize in synchronized swimming? Zero. The Water Carnival has been going on in Fort Stockton since 1936. Third weekend in July is always Water Carnival. Same time, same place, every year. It's been some time since the old high dive was taken down for liability reasons, but the carnival is still an annual tradition, a mix of the old and the new. No, we haven't, but in the past, there has been a spaceship that has shot across Comanche Springs. Uh, we've had an aerial swinger across Here. Comanche Springs in a show. Was it Space Odyssey that the rocket went across? I think so. 2001 Space Odyssey. Water Carnival is kind of the anchor, the anchor that, that pulls everybody back, back in. It certainly helps the economy. Yes. Yeah. And actually, Jackie's and my friendship began at the swimming pool because she was a lifeguard when I would bring my children yeah. swimming. So she took care there of again, it's Comanche Springs. It, it just really has brings friends together. Yes, it does. And your 2014 Miss Fort Stockton is Lindsay Venegas. Here's the odd thing about Comanche Springs. It's still the center of Fort Stockton cultural life, but it's also the epicenter of a decades-old rift, one that has never really healed. There's times in, in 1942 where there wasn't a water carnival. Because of World War II. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then we had low water. That was you know, when the springs were drying up or before they built the swimming pool. At the heart of the rift is the water that used to flow from Comanche Springs. When the water carnival first began, the springs ran at about 30 million gallons a day. Springs this size in Texas are unusual. Though there are thousands of places where water below ground comes to the surface, it's usually in the form of small seeps and springs. Not so with Comanche. Comanche was among the biggest, around the same size as Austin's Barton Springs. But around the end of World War II, the land just west of Comanche Springs was tapped by wells bigger than anything Fort Stockton had ever seen. 
and no one in Fort Stockton had more wells than the Williams Farms. We've been farming here on and off for 70 years. Jeff Williams is the grandson of Clayton Williams Sr., a name in Fort Stockton synonymous with the demise of Comanche Springs. We have 42 wells, but we use 32 of them during the growing season, which is roughly, that's about 35 million gallons a day. In the years after World War II, new wells drilled by the Williams Farms began intercepting the water that would have flowed out of Comanche Springs. The springs began to sputter. By 1962, they had stopped completely. You know, grandfather came out and said, you know, if we drill water wells here, you can farm, irrigate it. Where the fight came was when they started irrigating out here, dried up the springs, the folks that were using the water from the springs, well, they, there's not as much water over there. All the big water is right here. Farmers that had used Comanche Springs to irrigate their crops filed suit against Clayton Williams Sr. The case went all the way to the Texas Court of Appeals, which in 1954 handed down a landmark decision that the groundwater users could continue to pump to their heart's content, no matter what effect it had on Comanche Springs. The reason, the court argued, is that groundwater in the state of Texas is private property. And if in the lawful use of that private property, a landowner dries up the wells or springs on someone else's land, there is nothing the state can do about it. The concept is known as the rule of capture. Even after Jeff's dad, Clayton Williams Jr., made his fortune on oil and gas, he kept the Williams Farms running. We're the largest permit holder of water in this region, in, in Texas alone, I mean in general, other than municipalities. We have the largest permit held by one person. The Williams Farms are laced with irrigation ditches, coursing with water. Some of their irrigation pivots are nearly a mile in length, watering fields of grasses two miles across. I think it takes around 5,000 gallons of water to make one 65-pound bale of alfalfa. Is it quite logical to grow high water use crops in the Chihuahuan Desert? No, probably not. But we have a perfect climate for it. We have the water is here. So what do you use it? Do you let it sit in the ground or you utilize it for a commercial purpose? We're utilizing it for commercial purpose. Williams is a name that brings up strong emotions in Fort Stockton. And in the retelling of the drying of Comanche Springs, it's often Clayton Williams Sr. himself who pumped the springs dry. But in reality, there were dozens of other landowners implicated in the lawsuit. Williams was just the biggest. I asked Jeff what it felt like to bear the name most associated with the death of Comanche Springs. Um, I can understand to a certain extent, some of the, the fallout and, you know, would I like to have been downstream and the water dried up on my farm? No, I would have been mad too. Um, I've been here long enough. I've got enough love of the land that I, I can understand both sides of the deal, but the rule of capture was the rule of capture. Texas is the only state in the Union where the rule of capture still applies, where neighbors can pump each other dry without repercussion. And while in many places, including Fort Stockton, the rule of capture is now held in check by groundwater regulation, about a fifth of the state has no limits on how much groundwater can be pumped. Sometimes, as in the case of Comanche Springs, the decision to regulate groundwater comes too late, and whoever wins is the person with the biggest pump. If you want to see what the rule of capture can create, there's a dry hole in the ground in Fort Stockton, willing to tell the tale. Its name is Comanche Springs. Reporting from Fort Stockton, I'm Sarah Wilson. In the early 80s, a hydrologist named Gunnar Bruni published Springs of Texas, a catalog of the places where groundwater came to the surface. Even then, Bruni says in the preface, the story of Texas Springs is largely a story of the past. And as you flip through the book, you come to see what he means. Coldwater Creek in Dallam County hasn't had water in it for more than a generation. Parker Springs in Death Smith County are marked now only by a dead tree. The roaring springs of Tarrant County no longer roar. 
Since Bruni published Springs of Texas in 1981, many more springs have gone dry. The San Antonio Springs no longer flow. The dripping springs of Hayes County no longer drip. Well, you get the picture. As we discovered on our trip to Comfort, Texas, this statewide decline in groundwater levels isn't by accident. It's by design. When I was growing up, we had crops in there. We'd have, we'd make hay for the livestock. We had really old farming equipment. We had some equipment that was pulled by a horse. And I actually rode behind and used that equipment. It's now pasture art. <laughs> David Langford's family has been working the Hillingdon Ranch in Comfort, about an hour northwest of San Antonio, since it was founded in 1885. It was the springs that watered the cattle in his great-grandfather's time, says Langford. And they did all the way through my teen years. But in the past decade, the spring-fed creeks that once flowed year-round now only flow after rain. The reason why, Langford says, is a quickly dropping groundwater table. In about 2001, the water level began declining. And from 2001 until now, the water level in our well has dropped 60 feet. What changed isn't water use on the ranch, but thousands of groundwater wells that have been drilled in the 50 mile radius around it. This part of the hill country is one of the fastest growing parts of the state. And most of the growth has been enabled by groundwater pumping. The drop in Langford's well mirrors the trend that can be seen across the Trinity Aquifer, a drop projected to continue. It's bad enough that we have lost 60 feet in the last 10 or 12 years of groundwater resources, where there was no diminishment of groundwater resources for the previous 100 or so years. That's bad enough. Our elected officials have decided that we should provide, we being the whole area, should provide an additional 30 feet of drawdown. Every region in Texas has to set a goal for how much groundwater they want to have left in 50 years. And in the area around Langford's Ranch, locals have decided they want a groundwater table that's 30 feet lower than it is today. The Texas Hill Country is known as everybody's backyard. And everybody loves it, and they want to move here, and I can't blame them. Those people that come here, they're living their vision of the American dream, and I don't want to spoil that for them. But I don't think they realize that where the water comes from when they turn their tap on to those of us that are trying to maintain our heritage up here with groundwater resources that are not only diminishing, but that are going to diminish more on purpose. And here's the thing. He says these groundwater targets, which are called desired future conditions, are designed to enable growth. But an unintended consequence is that they are going to lead to less water in the rivers that supply about a quarter of the state all the way to the Gulf Coast. Now, ultimately, it seems like there's an unresolved question surrounding groundwater management in Texas. Is our groundwater regulation preserving the resource, or is it just passing the problem to the next generation? To answer just that question, I went to San Antonio to meet with Weir Labatt. Labatt was appointed by Governor Rick Perry to the Texas Water Development Board, the state's water infrastructure bank and groundwater science agency. If we don't protect major springs in this country, then we are seriously destroying the long-term viability of this country. We were standing on a little bridge in San Pedro Springs Park in downtown San Antonio. Labatt pointed to the dry creek bed below us. I've seen pictures of water that just was artesian, that just flowed out of the springs up in the air. Today, the springs in San Antonio are dry, as they have been for the past decade. Nowadays, the San Antonio River, known as the river walk to most tourists, is watered exclusively by recycled sewage. But we weren't at San Pedro to talk about why they were dry. We were there to find out why the other big springs of the Edwards Aquifer, the major springs that draw tubers by the thousands during the summer to San Marcos and New Braunfels, were still flowing. As it turns out, says Labatt, it's all thanks to a lawsuit. In 1991, the Sierra Club filed a lawsuit under the Endangered Species Act saying that we weren't taking steps to protect the endangered species at Comal and San Marcos Springs. These endangered species include the blind salamander, which has lived in the darkness of the Edwards Aquifer for so long, it no longer has eyes. As it turns out, it wasn't just the environmentalists clamoring for its protection. 
people downstream of the springs realized that the blind salamander may be their last hope in keeping their river from being pumped dry. One of those downstream interests, says Labatt, was the Guadalupe Blanco River Authority, which counts Dow Chemical among its biggest water users. And uh, they didn't think, we, we were negotiating, but we weren't serious about doing anything. The case went to federal court in 1993, heard by Judge Lucius Bunton. He gave the case four days. Uh, Judge Bunton had a history of uh, pulling out his uh, squirt gun if the lawyers got too windy and he would uh, squirt the lawyers with his squirt gun. And that was an indicator for them to, they were through. <laughs> Judge Bunton's decision was clear. He was really telling the legislature, you had better do something state legislature in 1993, or you will feel the blunt ax of the federal government. If we didn't solve the problem at a state level, the judge was gonna take over control of the Edwards Aquifer. And nobody in the state of Texas wanted that to happen. Sure enough, the Texas legislature acted, creating the Edwards Aquifer Authority, which would have to come up with a plan to reduce groundwater pumping, to keep the springs in San Marcos and New Braunfels flowing, even if the drought of the 1950s returned. 20 years sounds like a long time, but it was barely enough to get these warring factions to cooperate, says Labatt. I would consider it a miracle that we were able to come to an agreement. Two or three times we thought we were going to fall apart, and then at the next meeting somebody would come forth with a compromise and we'd keep going. In 2014, the Edwards Aquifer Recovery Implementation Program was adopted. The ERIP, as it's called, spells out exactly how much water would be taken out of play for farmers and cities including San Antonio, New Braunfels, and San Marcos. I asked Labatt, would the spring still be flowing if it weren't for the blind salamander? I uh, doubt it, uh, very seriously doubt it. Uh, we would just continue to man the pumps. And I think we would have dried up the springs years ago. The Edwards Aquifer Authority is one of the few groundwater districts in the state of Texas that limits groundwater to keep springs flowing. Austin's Barton Springs and the Fort Clark Springs in West Texas are protected through the same type of triggers as are streams in a handful of counties between Austin and Waco. But none of the state's other rivers are protected from groundwater pumping. The reason why, Labatt says. The property rights in the minds of many people trump anything else. If you continue with that logic forever, then your property right is going to dry up your groundwater table. If you don't take care of the common good, then you have what is known as tragedy of the commons and everybody suffers in that case. With the ERIP as a model, will more Texans seek a balance between the common good and private property rights? The next indication may come in 2016, when, for the first time ever, every groundwater district in Texas will be required to report what effect their desired future conditions will have on springs. So even if we set limits on how much water we pump out of the ground, it just doesn't seem possible that we can continue to grow without draining everything dry. I mean, we hear these things we're supposed to do to conserve water. Don't run the faucet while you're brushing your teeth. Put in a high-efficiency toilet. Tear out your turf grass and grow native plants. But all of those water savings being enough to conserve our way out of scarcity seems kind of far-fetched, especially when you're driving through miles of subdivisions that seem to have sprung up overnight. When your water supply is finite, eventually you have to hit a limit to growth, right? And if all we have is the water in our rivers and lakes and the water underground— and taking water from one robs water in the other, how can we sustain ourselves? Our reporter Dennis Foley heard about a third source of supply, one that people have relied on for as long as there's been a place called Texas. And so he went out to Dripping Springs to learn more. It took us a long time, actually, to, to find this house, but it had all the things in it that I really liked. and. And it had this rainwater system, and uh, I was like, oh, that's okay, it'll be fine. Julie and Larry Swafford live in Dripping Springs, around the corner from one of the subdivisions transforming this scrubby hill country region into a bedroom community for Austin. The Swaffords live entirely off of the water, collected from their roof. They weren't looking for a rainwater-fed house, it just kind of found them. Yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a concern, because, I mean, it was the house that we have doesn't have a well doesn't have city water, it only has rainwater. And I was sitting there saying, okay, well, I've always wanted to go off grid, you know, if I could. 
And this sounds interesting. I just didn't know if it was going to be enough to sustain us. The Swaffords moved into their rainwater-fed house right in the middle of the drought. Having never lived off rainwater before, Larry had his fair share of sleepless nights fretting over whether they would run out of water. The first couple of years that I was out here, we were in pretty big drought and hadn't had rain and all the other stuff. And our system got down to below half. I started fretting, and I bought 6,000 gallons worth of water. And the thing was is that I bought that water, and I paid it, and they brought it out. They pumped it into the collection cistern, and two weeks later, we had four inches of rain, and water was coming out and just pumping over the thing. And I said, never again. Even in drought, rooftop rainwater harvesting systems can capture enormous volumes of water. For a house with 2,000 square feet of roof, every inch of rain can produce 1,000 gallons of water. In an average year of rain in San Antonio, that's more than 30,000 gallons of water a year, which is about what the average house uses. So can you see anywhere in there the storage tank that we have? Larry took us on a tour of his rainwater system. There actually wasn't much to see. His storage tanks are buried in the backyard. And the Swafford's two-car garage is where the magic happens, where the water stored for months after it's captured is turned into clean drinking water. Mounted on the wall, next to a pegboard hung with gardening tools, was the Swafford's water purification system. Two filters and a UV light. All about the size of your average weed eater and a couple cans of paint. All the particulate matter is taken out down here, and if there's any germs or anything, it's taken out by this ultraviolet light. The result? Ultra clean water. And then it comes out, goes into the house, and it's just like a regular plumbing system. What's striking about the Swaffords is that they're pretty much as far from the stereotype of rainwater harvesters as you could imagine. For them, this isn't about environmentalism. It's about the most cost-effective way to get reliable water of the best quality in a place where it's in short supply. Yeah, somebody may want to call this radical. We had one person, you know, use the term water Nancy about collecting. You know, you, you do that because once you have one of these systems, you look around and you say, you know, I've got some roof over there. The water's not being collected and I want to do something. So you think about those things. You know, it, it, it isn't part of your everyday life, but you do think about it whenever it comes up. Oh, she needs in. She wants in. There are no estimates of how big a bite rainwater capture could take out of groundwater pumping in Texas. But if the rainwater capture plan for the city of Los Angeles, a place that gets about the same rainfall each year as West Texas, is any guide, the combined potential is enormous. Los Angeles, which uses more water each year than San Antonio, Victoria, San Marcos, Austin, and New Braunfels combined, plans to replace nearly half of the water it uses with locally captured water by the end of the century. From Dripping Springs, I'm Dennis Foley. For years, it's been assumed that declining groundwater is the necessary evil of a growing population. But that may not be the case, as some places in Texas are proving they can grow without using more water. Is it too late for the springs we've already lost? There's evidence that in some places they could be restored, if we limit our pumping enough to let nature catch up. Interested in learning more? Photos of the people and places you heard on this radio program, plus animation, videos, and more, are available at www.ourdesiredfuture.com. Our Desired Future is a project of the Texas Center for Policy Studies and was made possible by the Shield Heirs Foundation and the generous gifts of people who contributed to our Indiegogo campaign. Our Desired Future was produced by Charlene Lurig. We had sound production help from Homework Productions, Aaron Scott, The Sound Lab, and Phil Mazzetti. Our audio engineer was Dennis Foley. <laughs> 8,000 years. Let's go back 8,000 years. How about that? We'll leave you at San Marcos Springs with Gary and Cameron Perez. They're singing the Yanawana song of the Coyoltecan Indians, which celebrates the story of their people's birth from the Edwards Aquifer. Moved by the life of water, the words say, we sing and dance. Can no one
In Austin, Texas, I'm Jeff Mills. And I'm Charlene Lurig. Thanks for listening.